Welcome to a new segment on the Forest Hill Church podcast, where we are digging deeper into this past weekend's message. We've been covering a lot of ground on Sundays, and we want to take this time to slow down and dig deep into some of the wild and crazy stories found in the Old Testament. I'm Stacy Martin, one of your hosts. I'll be sharing the mic with other pastors and leaders here at Forest Hill. We're going to look at some of the details you may have missed and make sense of some of the stuff that makes us go, huh? Mm-hmm. Hmm? Hmm? Each Wednesday, the vidcast of this podcast will be available on our YouTube channel, and then the podcast will come up on the weekly Forest Hill Church podcast. My guest this week is Andy Gouda, the campus pastor of our Fort Mill campus. He and his wife, Erin, are the parents of three girls and one boy, and three of your kids are have a toe in adolescence, right? Oh, attitudinally, all of them do. <laughs> but chronologically, <laughs> yes, just three. And we have a puppy. So oh, that is a new feature. Full chaos. Yes. Dr. So, chaos. Yeah. We're also in toddler land with puppy. So oh. You know how that is. Oh, yes. Oh, that's crazy. Yep. Well, all of our campus pastors preached this past weekend uh, on Jacob, which is the <laughs> third character in this series in the line of kind of the baton passing that we've been talking about from Abraham to Isaac and now Jacob. So I was watching this video on this app called Read Scripture, and it basically is this little like cartoon video that unpacks the book of Genesis. And it was talking about how the book of Genesis is separated really into two parts. The first part being creation and Adam and Eve and how they all screwed up God's original plan. And then the other part is this family and how God is taking this family and going to start redeeming his whole, the whole original plan, you know, how to get back to his original plan. Um, And he starts it with this one family. And if I'm honest, this family is... Like, we talked about you being from East Tennessee. This could be an East Tennessee family. <laughs> or a Charlotte family. Or a Charlotte family. Or a New York or City a New York, family. Yeah, Long Island, you name it's it. It's just a family, right? I cannot get over how scandalous some of the stuff is. It's it? crazy, yeah, because people are crazy. Yes, and yeah. I love that God uses crazy people and not just spick and span, because I'm not sure I could relate if if it were spick and span characters. Yeah, yeah I'm with you, and this family is... Uh, very not spick and span. There's a lot of drama. There's, uh, well, in our story, I mean, there's all kinds of things that today we would look at and go, what? This just violates all sense of our, uh, yeah, our sensibilities, you know? Yeah. Well, you talked about the Bible being ancient literature. Yeah. Um, so the Bible, are they, are the books of the Bible, are they written in order or were they delivered in order? How is that working? They out? were arranged uh, by, by a group of people at different times in history. Um, they are generally divided. I think in the, maybe a good way to think about it is the first, first five books of the Bible are, are what uh, Jewish people and Christians have come to know as the Pentateuch. Hmm. And so they're the first five books, and really the goal of those books was to give a people who had just emerged from slavery some sense of history, some sense of rootedness, groundedness, and also a, a larger context, right? Because these people had been in slavery for 400 years. They come out of slavery... Hmm. They have this crazy experience with God. They're trying to figure out what kind of God he is. So the first five books of the Bible feel like they're moving really fast. Yeah. Um, But it's because the author of it, which we believe is Moses, was trying to give this family that had developed into millions of people a sense of the larger stage that their play was taking place on. Mm -hmm. And also the kind of God that had saved them and what he expected them to be. Um, so there's all kinds of stories in Genesis, but it was written, we think, to provide a uh, backdrop uh, against wow. which the people of Israel who had just come out of slavery that we read about in the book of Exodus, the very next book of the Bible, uh, for them to understand how they got there. Well, one of the things we talked about with Jason Smith last week was how important it is to tell these stories of faith to your kids. So that's kind of what the Old Testament is then, a, yeah. a, a historical recording of a family's movements through history and how God has shown up and throughout history. Yeah, that's a great way of, I think, especially understanding the book of Genesis, Mm. um, because the people who wrote it were not alive in that time. You have to think during that time, it was a lot of oral tradition, people sitting around campfires as families, telling stories, and history and rootedness was very important to those people. Just like today, we jump on um, Mm Ancestry.com or some of these other places we go to understand who we are as people, where we come from. That was even more important during that time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you find things in the Old Testament that we read about 
things like the genealogies where most of us decide to either skip or take a nap during or uh, just write it off that we don't understand this. Well, those are very important uh, to the families because they were able to trace their family tree all the way back and understand where they came from. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, I love that in the beginning of your message, you talked about that <clears throat> the battles we fight show who we really are. And you yeah. even connected it to um, characters in American history like Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King Jr. And I think we forget that the characters in the Bible were real people, yeah. just like Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King. Yeah. What would you say to somebody who's not sure they believe that the characters in the Bible are real people? Yeah, no, I think those are. that's a great question. First of all, I think it's really important to bring a honest, curious, skeptical mind mm. to the scriptures. And a lot of times as Christians, I don't know that we do as good of a job at doing that. Uh, but I think that where we bring honest questions, the Bible has honest answers. Mm. And where we understand um, the Bible was written for a purpose, for a specific people, we can understand what the author intends. So you look at characters like Jacob. Um, Jacob is connected through oral tradition and also through genealogies that are written down. And these people whose names you can't pronounce, they're lists of, you know, this guy's father was this father, and this guy's father was this father, this guy's father. And it goes back for generations mm -hmm. upon generations. And the intent behind that is to show that these are real people. And they, they had parents, and they had siblings, they had children, and there are events that are connected to their lives. So it's not just historical uh, mythology, it is real people in real place. Plus, you, you look at each of these stories, and we see very human characteristics. Yeah. They're not the, the people of Greek mythology that are just superhuman kind of people that did superhuman things. Yeah. They're flawed, broken train wrecks of people. Well, it's interesting. I think that's a perfect segue into my next question, because we see very early on that Jacob is living up to his name, his name meaning trickster. Yep. And um, it seems unusual that God would choose someone. I mean, when I read the story and even heard you preaching it, I kept thinking, gosh, Jacob just kind of seems rotten a little bit on the inside. Like he, yep. I know that God has big plans for him, but gosh, the way he treats his father, he treats his brother, he treats other people. You just think, gosh, how can somebody who seems to have that little deceitful bent yeah. be used for something so big? Yeah. Well, thank God that he can use people as messed up as Jacob and as messed up as me to do things uh, in the world. Because if you take an honest look at all of us, we're all in Jacob's camp. Now, we may not have done crazy stuff like tricked our brother and our father out of a birthright or out of an inheritance. Mm -hmm. But, all, I mean, we all line up in that camp of uh, just complete moral failures that do crazy stuff, that make us undeserving of a relationship with God, of being used by God. I mean, that's all of our stories, yeah, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, God chooses Jacob to kind of continue this idea of a covenant. What exactly is a covenant? Because we use that word a lot in churches. Yeah. And um, sometimes I'm not sure. I know for me, sometimes I think I use it and I don't really know what it means. Yeah, it's that's a great question. Um, a covenant is a very, very ancient agreement. Um, and when promise just wouldn't do because we we make promises all the time yeah. i promised my daughter i'd take her to tcby last week i got busy i forgot she accused me of lying to her it turned into a family thing right um so we make promises <laughs> all the time um but covenants are different um, covenants are ceremonies they're agreements between two people usually in the covenant that we read about between abraham and god it is what's called a suzerain vassal covenant. And oh, it is wow. it's something where you've got a king who has a tremendous amount of power holding all the cards, and he enters into an agreement with a less powerful entity. And in, that, in Abraham's case, Isaac's case, Jacob's case, I mean, those, that's them. And so God mm -hmm. is the one who is in charge, and he makes an agreement with them as their king, as the one who's holding all the power in the relationship. Okay. And attached to that agreement are vows. I promise to do this and to not do this. There are warnings. If you do this, you will. this will mm. happen to you. So there's consequences for violating it, but mm. there's also blessings. And so what we studied a couple weeks ago is we looked at the character of Abraham and Jason covered last week with Isaac again. Um, it is that suzerain vassal covenant treaty uh, where God in an incredible, incredible display of hum humility really shows us his character. He enters into this covenant and instead of putting all the pressure on Abraham, he puts it all on himself. Oh, wow. Man, that's interesting. Yeah, because I think we 
use covenant and promise as the same word. Yeah, and they're it's not. not. Yeah, it's covenants not have gravity. There's power behind them. They they are unbreakable. And that's why when we make covenants in our own lives, like marriage, I believe, is a covenant. Yeah. And that's why when we see divorce, it's more than just a violation of a promise. And yeah. the, the emotional collateral damage that's associated um, with divorce on both sides, right? I mean, yeah. that is evidence, too. It's not just a promise that's being broken here. It's something much more significant. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Well, this next part of the story... I got to tell you, reminded me of my days of getting off the bus in high school, running home, making a bowl of chips and salsa and watching General Hospital. I spent my afternoon with General Hospital. Okay. And this little part of the story with Jacob, I was right back in the drama. And Well, let's talk about General Hospital for a minute. (laughs) Let's turn it back on you. I I would rather not. (laughs) It shaped a lot of who I am, but the Lord (laughs) is working on me. (laughs) Good, good. But this story, so Jacob sees this woman, yes. love at first sight, yeah. maybe lust at first sight, Who all knows? the things. Yep. She is hot to Molly. Yeah. He's, he's got to be involved yeah. in that. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> his, his dad, or her dad is like, yeah, not so much. Yeah. Prove yourself to me seven years, and yep. then you can have her. Yep. And he gets tricked. Yes, Jacob he does. Jacob gets tricked. Yep. He shows up on his, well, not even his wedding night, really the next morning after he gets married, and there is her sister, Leah, who um, I I think her name means horse face, but I think in modern mm. terms it would be but a face. You know, <laughs> <laughs> everything but her face is nice. attractive. Yeah. I know, poor Leah. But that poor is Leia. the truth. I mean, that's yeah. the truth. She, Rachel was the beautiful one, and he got tricked into accidentally marrying yep. her homely sister. He says something, I think, about uh, the wedding veils of the day and probably <laughs> the caliber of the wedding party. Uh, that evening that he wouldn't realize who it was he uh, was marrying. <laughs> yes, yes. I think there was a lot of wine in yes. the Old Testament days at these wedding was. celebrations. Yeah. Yep. Well, so that story in and of itself is juicy and all kinds of drama. General hospital worthy. General hospital yeah. worthy. Actually, I'm pretty sure there was a whole storyline in one of the seasons. But I think the thing that stopped me in my track when you were going um, through the story is that Leah or Rachel was Jacob's cousin. Yeah. They're related. Yeah. So that's incest. Uh, indeed. That yep. made me go, what? Yeah. Uh, why? How? Why is this in the Old Testament? Why, yeah. it's why almost is like It's almost like reading the accounts of the royal families of Europe, right? Yes. I mean, because they married off cousins and second cousins and, you know, for a season in early American history and maybe even today in some parts of the American mm-hmm. South. I mean, that's a desirable <laughs> thing, you know? Uh, not where we live, of course. <laughs> yeah. But... You know, that has not always been culturally frowned upon. Yeah. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we, are, we engage in kind of a, a cultural elitism mm. where we view our own cultural standards of today as being the thing that we, we think are absolute truth, but it's not always been that way. Um, mm. we, we, we have cultural standards as well that we hold to. So would you say the same thing about it then, about the polygamy that shows up here? Because that's the other thing. So oh, yeah. all of a sudden... You know, he realizes he d- doesn't get to marry Rachel, so he has to work another seven years. Yep. So then he has two wives. Yep. And then later throughout the story, when he talks about his 12 sons, and you're reading through this genealogy, yep. that it looks like he's got kids with Rachel, kids yep. with Leah, and then kids with two servants. Yeah, two ser- a couple servants in there, you know. So is that kind of the same thing as far as the cultural? Yeah, it was cultural. Day? Yeah, I mean, that was, um, that was a way to ensure the uh, the size and the success, the stability of the family. Um, so it was definitely a cultural thing. We, we see it's not part of God's original design in Genesis. And by the time the newer part of the Bible, the New Testament rolls around, polygamy uh, was largely a thing of the past. Um, but for that time in that culture, it was an accepted practice. Mm-hmm. And we see that also show up in other big heroes of the Old Testament, like King David and King Solomon. I mean, yeah. those guys... Wow, there's a lot of a lot of wives and concubines and people running around their, their so palaces. So for people who read about that or hear about that, and that becomes a barrier to them, yeah. what would you say? What is the one thing that you'd say to help people get past that fact and stick with the story to see how it all plays yeah. out? Yeah, well, I think it, I think just say you're reading about real people who lived in a real culture that was really different than ours. Mm. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of times we're, we are blind to some of our own cultural beliefs that a couple thousand years from now, people will look at us and say, wait a minute, you did what? You thought mm-hmm. what? Uh, but we're, we're blind to it. We just think of it as normal and not a big deal. Yeah. Um, but truly, I think we can look at the polygamy thing and say, I don't know how wise that is, yeah. right? 
I can tell you right now, despite all cultural norms, my husband, the idea of having two women bossing him around in our house is more than he could <laughs> even stand. So he's looking at that and thinking, Jacob, well, you I have, a fool. I have four women bossing me. My oh, three God, daughters and dear. Yeah. I feel for these people. You know? <laughs> yeah, you are a real person in real history. <laughs> With experience. a real family yeah. and all kinds of real dysfunction, but that's another hey, podcast. But that's, hey, that's the Forest Hill Parenting Podcast. <laughs> that's right. I need yeah. to just listen to that yeah. one, I think. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So now to the meat of the message. You really spent your the message focusing on Jacob and his wrestling match with God. Yeah. That there was a time in Jacob's story where he was in kind of in a painful season in a time of transition. Yeah. And he finds himself on a riverbank sleeping in the middle of the night yeah. and has a wrestling match with a man. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about how some people thought it could have been Esau, but really when you unpack the scripture, um, it's God. So was it a literal wrestling match? It's a great question. It's a great question. I think there's a there's a certain beauty and an artistic license that we have to mm. give the storyteller who's telling this story. Which is Moses. Which is Moses. Okay. But again, it was oral tradition by the time he wrote it down. Okay. So you got to think, for centuries sitting around the campfire, these guys told these stories mm. to one another. So whether it was a literal wrestling match or a figurative one, a spiritual one, um, I don't know how important that is. That's not the point mm. of the story, nor is the point of the story who he was wrestling against. Mm. I do think it was important that he was wrestling yeah, um, because that's something profoundly human all of us can relate with. Personally, I think it was a real wrestling match. Yeah, I think you can look at um, the limp. That was an important part of the story. Uh, either Jacob just kind of fell or hurt himself somehow and then wrote it off as being part of this story or not. I think it was a legitimate historical detail that the storyteller puts in there for us. Because we read in a couple verses after the wrestling match, this was the reason why the Israelites didn't eat the tendon of the hip going forward was because it was in memory of Jacob's wrestling with the angel. So there was a... Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so there's that a, is So there's a cultural practice that emerged from this. Personally, I think it was a real wrestling match. Um, but if you don't think it was a real wrestling match, that's okay. Yeah. Well, I can tell you there have been nights where I have figuratively wrestled with God in yeah. my mind, in my dreams, in my yeah. psyche, and I wake up feeling like I've had a physical wrestling match. So, Absolutely. I mean, I think I think that's so much of how we process things. I know I, the times that I've gone through painful seasons or worrying seasons, and I really am wrestling with God, you do, I mean, it feels like a literal wrestling match. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. I, I think about um, the story of Jesus in the garden the night mm -hmm. before he was crucified. And he went through a spiritual wrestling match with God uh, to the point where he sweated blood. Mm. He was asking, let this, let this cup pass from me. If there's any way to accomplish your will, God, outside of me being publicly humiliated and executed, let it happen. I mean, that's got to be a wrestling match, right? Yeah. So maybe not a, a physical one, but certainly a spiritual one. Absolutely. Well, one of the things about Jacob is that he was holding on for a blessing in spite of the pain yeah. of, all, of all that was going on. So you have four kids, we oh, yeah. alluded to them. What do you say to them when they're going through painful seasons? Because I think all of our kids, whether they're young, they're adolescents, even adult children, we're going to see them go through painful seasons. And some of our kids have access to great spiritual leaders like yourself. Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> but the rest of us are just regular parents, you know, that... Yeah. Um, I'm just a regular parent to you. Yes, you are. Um, and it breaks my heart to see my kids yeah. go through wrestling seasons mm. so we're wrestling we wrestle with friends a lot mm. you know with having them with not having them with friends said this friends didn't say this friends included these people they didn't include me uh, friends are bullies all kinds of stuff so yeah. friendships are something that we wrestle with quite a bit in my house with my kids um, and I think that uh, as a dad just to be able to sit with them and listen and have my heart break for them mm -hmm. and, and they can see that mm -hmm. and and tell them it's going to be okay you're going to get through it. Your mom and I love you. God loves you. Your, your family loves you. And you have, your friends love you too. But they're just teenagers. And teenagers are punks on the whole. <laughs> yeah. At least I used to be. I was you know? one. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, but I think for even adults, that helps to create a very healthy paradigm for us as we go through wrestling matches too. To know that, as we talked about yesterday, God is with us. You know, he's with us in our wrestling. And we're wrestling with loneliness or betrayal or diagnosis or whatever it may be. God is with us and he loves us. And he's whispering to us, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You're going to make it through it. 
Um, you are, as we talked about yesterday, one of my children. Mm. And because of that, you are more than a conqueror in this situation. Whatever is plaguing you right now, causing you sleepless nights, there'll be a day when it is no more. Mm. And you will continue to be, right? Yeah. You will continue to conquer. I mean, to me, that brings a tremendous amount of encouragement. So I think as a dad, I, I try to bring some of that to my kids yeah. too. Just I love you. It's going to be all right. I'm here with you. We're going to get through it together. I love that. Well, that was one of the things about Jacob is that, um, so God asks him, who are you? And he just says, Jacob, a trickster, like a know nothing, a cheater. You know, this is who I am. I'm not going to be any better than what I am. And and God says, no, no, no. Who are you? And I love that. I love that there is, like even with your own children, you're saying you are loved. You are cherished. Like this is the substance of you, not the label of you. Yeah. What do you think um, are some of the things that we let define us? Oh, Just man. like Jacob is letting his actual definition of his name yeah. define him. What are you? What do you think some of those things are? Yeah, wow. I think um, you can fill in the blank with almost an infinite number of possibilities. For me, I let um, performance define me mm. a lot. And I grew up in a house where I was a sports guy. And so if I was... Batting over 300, that's Hall of Fame material. If I'm not, then I should just be cut from the team, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think a lot of us base our, our value, our identity off performance. I'm a winner. I'm an achiever. I am an upward mover. I'm a high potential earner. Um, all of those kind of performance indicators. So I know that's a big one. Another one is, you know, who's around you? What kind of people are around you? Do you have the right people around you? Do you have a lot of people around you? I think in, in the digital world, you know, how much, um, how many ripples are you creating on, you know, social media or in podcasts or how much content are you pushing out, you know, and um, I think I think that we can fall prey to that too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love that when God circles back around to Jacob and says, no, no, not, not Jacob, not your name, who are you? And, yeah. and God says, you are no longer Jacob, you are Israel. Yeah. So how does that Jacob's new name as Israel actually connect to the country Israel that we see today? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's interesting because a couple chapters after this wrestling match shows up in Genesis 32. So in Genesis 35, God appears again. He shows up to Jacob. He's already reconciled with his brother and he's moving on with his life. God shows up again and reminds him that his name has been changed to Israel. The one who has wrestled with God and man and you've overcome and from then on, we see him referred to not as Jacob, but Israel. Mm. And his family becomes the children of Israel, the tribes of Israel. And his sons, his 12 sons, become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 wow. clans. So the nation is actually named after this patriarch, after this one man. And I think symbolically, they are people throughout their history who have wrestled with other nations, who have wrestled with their God, and they have overcome. They have endured. They're still around. Wow, that is interesting. Yeah. That is really, that's really interesting. So Jacob names the place that he saw God face to face, Peniel. Yeah. I love that. I love, we saw that in even um, talking about Abraham and Hagar, that she named the place, the God who sees, that there's all these places where God shows up that people give it a name because yeah. of the significance of the encounter oh, with yeah. God. Yeah. Where would that place be for you? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, I was I had coffee with a guy this morning, and we were just kind of getting to know each other, sharing stories. I told him I went to business school at Tennessee, and he said, "Is that where you felt a call to ministry?" And I said, "No, <laughs> that's where I felt a call to cheer for the Tennessee Volunteers." Um, but I felt a call to ministry when I was in Israel, um, which I was given as a graduation gift from college. I went over to Israel for a two week study tour. And while I was over there, the world of the Bible became real to me, and not just a world of stories that I've read about my whole life, but it's a real place, and there's real dust, and there's real rocks, and the mm-hmm. Sea of Galilee is a real place where the fish bite you. Um, uh, it's just, it's, an, it's got its own smells, and its own culture, its own music. The wind is a certain, you know, the, the temp- certain temperature. So it became real to me, and I heard God say to me, um, which is rare because it doesn't happen to me a whole lot, but Andy, I've made you to serve me and you're going to be unhappy until you kind of get with the program, buddy. So um, for me, I think about Israel as probably being that place for me. And also think about Forest Hill. I really wrestled with my, my calling to shepherd and pastor people. I didn't want to do it. 
Um, Cause you started off in adult discipleship and before Maybe. that in counseling. Oh yeah. really? Okay. So I was working with adolescents and families and then Forrest still hired me to, to be part of their counseling team. And I did that. I love that. And then God kind of led me by the nose through uh, the discipleship world into pastoral ministry. And discipleship just meaning the way people uh, grow in their faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. The way that people grow. And uh, it's always fun for me to watch how people transform and grow when they encounter God. And they change. People change. To me, it's one of the great explanations of the truth of Christianity is to watch a life change that happens in people. Mm. Some things stay the same, you know. I can still be quite a jerk at times, uh, but I was before uh, Jesus got a hold of me. Uh, but there's other things about me that are totally different. Yeah. I'm nodding my head for those of you who are on the podcast. <laughs> Not that Andy's still a jerk, but that, uh, yes, can. yes, that. She's that, in a lot of meetings with me. She sees this. It's resonating with me, too. There are times where I respond to my kids in a way that I think, God, that was so ugly and felt like the old Stacy. I wish I had done that differently. <laughs> Why do I keep slipping back and doing things or saying something Because you're to my still Stacy. Yes. And I'm still Andy. That's just the way we are. I feel like I need a new name. Uh, like, uh, God, yeah. if you could work on that for me. There's a day coming. <laughs> yeah, there's a day coming. <laughs> well, I love what you talked about how people really, when their faith grows, when they get into this relationship with Jesus, like you were saying along the discipleship pathway that you know you were talking about, that there is real life change. Yeah. But there are a lot of people who have a hard time letting go of what defines them, yep. um, whether they're defined by a name or a mistake they've made in the past. I was laughing with some people on my team that I used to pray that God would give me amnesia hmm. because there were times when I would remember a decision that I made yeah. and I would feel the heat oh, from yeah. my toes come all the way up and think, oh, gosh, that feels like another person. Like, why did I do that, that sickness? And I would pray that God would give me amnesia so I wouldn't feel the shame. Yeah. And I, I mean, I feel like he answered that for me, yeah. uh, quite honestly. <laughs> if you know me, I'm a little bit of an open book. I probably need a little more shame. <laughs> um, but what about these people who still feel defined by a name or an action or even a generational curse, like yeah. the baggage of their family? Yeah. yeah. What, what would you say to them? Yeah. First of all, I'd say shame is powerful. And I, I deal with it in truckloads as well. And things I've done and said to people in the past that, man, I wish I could either forget or at the very least help those people forget, you know. Um, but I think the story of Jacob can illuminate for us maybe a way forward mm. um, because Jacob walked away from his wrestling match with a limp. He carried it with him. He was wounded from that point on. There was always a physical reminder of his wrestling match. And through that wrestling match came not only the limp, but the grace to continue forward, mm. the strength to move on, that blessing that he asked for and he received, it was given to him the same time uh, the woundedness was. So uh, one thing that I think is a danger in modern Christianity is that we whitewash our pasts and we whitewash our wounds and our shame and all of the baggage that we carry with us. There comes a point where we don't need to carry um, the damage from it. And there's yeah. a difference, I think, between a healthy shame and an unhealthy shame. Yeah. A healthy shame says, I was a jerk. I mean, I yelled at people and treated people and I would get in fights and do things that I regret. And now. I don't want to be like that it, anymore. But that's the woundedness that I can look at and say, I'm not that way anymore. God has changed me. And that is a evidence of the blessing he's given me, you know? And so I need to carry with me the woundedness as much as I carry with me the blessing. Uh, another way to think about it is, I need to carry with me the sin, a reminder of the sin that I've had in my past that still plagues me, but I can't be a messenger for God's grace unless I also am a messenger for my need for God's grace, that yeah. sin uh, that I have, that all of us have, you know. So for us to be defined by the shame and our, and our, um, our, our brokenness is not healthy. That is not healthy. God has set us free from that. But for us to forget about it, that's probably not healthy either because then we think we are um, spiritual superheroes and we're not that. The only reason we're something is because God has given us his grace. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Forest Hill Congregation, as you are joining us on the weekends, if you have questions about what you just heard or from any previous messages um, in this series, shoot us an email at info at forresthill.org or join us on any of our campus Facebook pages and send us a message. We want to be able to take some of your questions and answer them here as well. Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. It's always good to be with you. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. See you. <laughs>